All right, welcome to this month's Midwestern University Clinics live stream. Excited to have you here, and I really wanted to thank you all for spending some time with us today. Talking about a topic I think is pretty relevant this time of year. We're all in that new year, new you, new us mode of kind of thinking. A lot of us thinking of starting maybe an exercise routine that we may have fallen off of from years past. I know that's been me last year and maybe some years prior as well. But before we get into today's topic, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Mark Cargilla. I'm a physical therapist of 20 years, uh, originally from Michigan and now here in Arizona. I've been with Midwestern University for six years now and uh, work in our physical therapy institute where we see patients um, you know, full time Monday through Friday in the clinic, working with all sorts of orthopedic conditions, chronic pain conditions, balance. We have all sorts of services here at the Midwestern University Clinic, same there in Downers Grove, which Tom will talk about. Uh, and exercise is a big part of what we do as physical therapists. So this is a common discussion we have with patients, common question we have, especially this time of year. So I think this will bring some value to you all as you may be considering exercise yourselves. Tom, why don't you introduce yourself, sir? Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, very similar. Um, I am also a clinic assistant professor here on our Downers Grove campus. Most of my time is in the clinic treating uh, orthopedic cases mostly. Um, I do some teaching. I do a little bit of clinic research when there's time available for it. Um, but yeah, you, you nailed it. I mean, this is more of a generalized topic than we've done in the past, but it's pretty relevant to the time, uh, especially New Year's resolutions. Um, but more specifically, why are physical therapists talking about it? Well, I mean, we're constantly exercising people or encouraging exercise or building plans for people. Most of our treatments, I would argue, have a huge exercise component to them. Now, our, our reasons for providing certain exercises matter, but um, it is a large, large portion of what we do. So happy to be here to talk about it. Yeah, and today we'll try to touch upon pretty broad uh, topics around exercise, just to hopefully answer a lot of the questions or concerns that we hear a lot of patients and people who are looking to get an exercise have. Obviously, if there's any questions you have that we may not be answering or ones you have, don't hesitate to drop them in the comments. We're happy to answer those as we talk along today. Uh, Tom, one of the big things I think we probably should talk about before we get into this uh, is, are you safe to exercise? Because there's some conditions and th some things I think we need to think about before we embark on an exercise program. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit with what you've, what we look at and what things we probably want to see are on board before we start exercising? Yeah, I think uh, we, we hear all the time about whenever someone recommends a particular exercise routine or class, there's always that caveat or that fine print that says consult your physician before you begin an exercise routine. And that's a lot of its liability, right? They don't want to be liable for telling someone to do something wrong. But uh, there is a, a lot of safety behind that. If we're dealing with some, some uh, cardiovascular issues or uh, pretty fragile sort of cardiac related issues. We don't want you going out and doing vigorous activity that could lead to some some potential problems. So certain diseases, certain pathologies, um, certain underlying conditions uh, would require either a clearance from your physician or at least a discussion with your physician or if you have a good relationship with your physical therapist on uh, the safety of you pursuing a new program. Yeah, and we will screen vitals and things if sometimes we do get people who come in direct access. But if there's any significant cardiovascular history, definitely if you've been in contact with a cardiologist or somebody in your that's past, fine. that's something you probably want to make sure you touch base with and get clearance from that before you embark on exercise. You want to make sure people are positioned for success with that. Uh, we'll talk to this a bit too, because there's a lot of conditions some people have some thoughts about like arthritis chronic back issues and things that sometimes are make people understandably hesitant to exercise. So we'll touch on those today. Um, but let's first go into a little bit of the benefits of exercise. I mean, there's a litany of exercise. And as Tom said, you're talking to a biased set of folks here. Exercise is one of our primary means of interacting with people. Um, I really enjoy making exercise something that's fun and fits in somebody's life and looks like what they want to be doing in life. So I think sometimes exercise gets a bad rap of you just got to be sitting in a gym two hours, three hours a day doing things that you don't maybe want to do. So we'll talk to that as well. But Tom, can you speak to a little bit about kind of the benefits of exercise? Yeah, I mean, a lot. some of this is very uh, obvious, but I think having it outlined in front of us uh, really helps people just refocus on it. So one of the phrases I love to hear is uh, exercise is medicine. And I really feel like as a healthcare um, professionals, we, we are slowly working our way towards really embracing that and, and how movement 
and exercise are incredibly beneficial. You know, there were times in our career, maybe not ours, but pre pre us, where bed rest was a big component to injury healing. And you can see the trend has shifted to movement is actually more beneficial. Weight bearing, getting those forces through the body can help actually promote healing more than not doing anything. And that really can tie into exercise as well. So exercise is medicine. Uh, what you also see is any research article you look at, I'm, I'm being a bit hyperbolic here, but any research article you read that looks at a particular intervention, I can guarantee you in the discussion, it says, regardless of what the intervention they're looking at, it will also say, well, with diet and exercise, it also, you know, these people do better. It's just a, a component to our lifestyle that is intertwined with so many sort of um, systems of our body in a healthy way. So obviously the, the big main ones would be improving strength, endurance, either from a muscle endurance standpoint or a cardiovascular endurance so that our blood's pumping more efficiently, our lungs are breathing more efficiently. Um, it can help with things like posture and even things that we may not think about right away, things like balance, you know, reducing your, your fall risk, especially in that older adult uh, community living older adult who might be more of a risk of falling exercise largely benefits it. That's why we have a job. This is what we do with people. I think also what I, I want to say is not just the physical changes in the changing in the systems of our body, um, but also the psychosocial elements of exercise are, are huge. And this is a bit out of our wheelhouse uh, to some degree, but you can't deny the idea that exercise improves mood. Uh, it, that's been shown, you know, and it also, for a lot of people, provides this space and op opportunity to like reflect, almost like a meditative thing. You know, I'm on that treadmill, I have zero distractions, and I'm able to reflect on whatever my day. And, and there's there's such a, a benefit for from a mental health perspective to that. And then lastly, with the psychosocial stuff, you may be providing someone with social interaction. If I'm going to the gym, seeing friends, I'm in, a, I'm in an exercise class with a group of people, we're all working towards that same goal. You know, there's, there's a ton of benefits from uh, biological through psychosocial, through the whole sort of body system. So, yeah. Yeah, I would echo what you say with the, the mental health benefits. And I think thankfully in healthcare and in the world in general, I think we're recognizing the vital importance of mental health. It's hard to be well physically if mentally you're not in good shape. And there's a lot of research and even I know in some of the psychology literature of using exercise for things like depression or anxiety and things. I know for me, that is my main tool of stress management is exercising. I feel much more sharp, much more focused, feel much more able to kind of adapt and adjust to some of the stressors in life. So it's just a good kind of stress buffering activity. The other thing I might add is just a common thing we'll see with exercise and prescribed exercises are our female population as we age, although males sometimes with osteoporotic or osteoporosis, osteopenia, those type of diagnosis where bone density becomes more of a challenge as some of those changes happen in the body, as especially some of our female, female patients, like I mentioned, are in the aging process. So exercise, especially weight bearing exercise that's stimulating your skeleton to maintain the best bone density, along with working very closely with your physicians and other folks to kind of manage the medical side of osteoporosis can be a huge benefit for those. And <clears throat> we do have a lot of clinicians here at Midwestern who work primary strength training for balance, like Tom said, and the risk of falls and falls become such a, a major issue as we age and can become a, a life-changing event for some folks. We see it, unfortunately, where, you know, head injuries or hip fractures can become literally life-threatening issues, or if not really life-changing issues where our independence and our ability to walk and care for ourselves and do the things that we want to do independently all of a sudden gets kind of stripped from us. So yeah, definitely um, huge, huge amount of benefits to exercise. And I, there are so many studies, like Tom mentioned, diet and exercise. If there's one fountain of youth, I tell my patients this, we've looked and we're continuing to look and all these things. Exercise probably is the closest thing we have to maintaining your, you know, aging as well as possible. And I've had the good fortune of working with probably tens of thousands of patients now um, and getting to see the patterns of behavior that make somebody age better than the, maybe the other patient. And exercise seems to be a common factor with that. Yeah, and just to just to highlight as well, I, I did not mention, but you did start to mention that as physical therapists, of course, exercise helps with injury prevention, <laughs> recovering from an injury, and managing pain are three major ones that we'll touch on as we, as we talk. 
Yeah, and you, let's talk a little bit about barriers because that's often we want to make sure. I think sometimes there's barriers that we get placed upon ourselves, um, and we can talk to those. But also barriers that sometimes maybe traditional ways of looking at pain and some of these medical conditions um, can make us really hesitant. And I know for me, having had herniated discs in my back and um, different things, you know, exercise can be a little bit of a tenuous, stressful activity as far as getting into it. But I th that's where obviously we guide a lot of patients on that pursuit in physical therapy. But I wonder if you can talk to some of the barriers you see with exercise out there, Tom, with your patients and, and some of the general population. Yeah, uh, I think I can name a couple that are, are fairly obvious and understandable. So things like money, and a cost of time and cost of money, obvious barrier. You know, gyms are expensive. It's impossible to cancel a gym membership. Uh, you got to like send in your left arm to get that done. Actually, saw some recently where they won't accept cancellations via phone, via letter via email it's it's wild anyway um a lack of experience in exercise and sort of a lack of knowledge of your your body and how it's supposed to respond to exercise is often a barrier for people and that's really where i'm going to get into probably the depth of what we we mean by the barriers that we're going to comment on mostly um pain pain's a big one i hurt so i don't want to move and we've spent a few times discussing in our other uh, conversations on rotator cuff and arthritis and back pain that that is a common barrier we have to deal with with our patients all the time is encouraging movement because we know the benefits of it, encouraging exercise because we know the benefits of it um, despite pain or to help the pain. And so understanding pain, which, look, I don't even claim to be full grasp of pain. It is a very complex uh, sensation for us to deal with. And everyone sort of interprets it a little differently or describes it a little differently. But um, there are ways to help someone understand that not every stimulus that our body receives belongs in a, the pain bucket, right? If we could get a little better at describing and understanding why the, the pain or discomfort exists, that'll help guide us and understand, are we still safe you know, what do we need to do in response to this? So a good example is something called uh, delayed onset muscle soreness that usually stops someone dead in their tracks when they start an exercise routine. I don't know if you want to comment on your experience with that. Yeah, no, I think there's, we try to prepare patients as much as possible when we start embarking on exercise, because often with patients in clinic, they're going to start exercising and that may not have been something common. And again, the exercise will, t will hopefully strip some of the beliefs that it has to be some you know, sweat band on heavy, high intensity thing. It, it should look at the things in life you want to be able to do. It can get, you know, more complex and gym related depending on your needs, but that's a part of exercises. You can fit it to your lifestyle, what you like to do. What, um, and it doesn't always have to look like the traditional treadmill thing, but yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of conditions where the delayed onset muscle soreness. we try to talk about, you know, you're going to be doing some things you haven't done in a while. Your muscles haven't squatted much they haven't you know like the common one we'll do is just getting folks to start doing some light squatting that's just like getting out of a chair getting out of a car a lot of people notice as they get weaker around knees or legs that that isn't as easy as they would like it to be they're having to pull and prod up on things you know their joints can start getting sensitive as a result of some of the weakness that builds up over time and the lack of kind of therapeutic loading and i would say you always want to build a callus around your joints as far as having robust you know strengthening and movement through there so your body's good at moving but we get often to where we aren't used to moving. And when we embark on movement, it can make our tissues a little sore. Now, we just gotta be careful, like, is it you know, damage, you know, or is it something that's just part of the body adapting to a new stimulus? And I, we would lean towards the latter. Now, obviously, if you injure yourself or, or have a sudden strain or sprain, that's different. But the natural response that we have when we embark on exercise that right, Tom rightly talks about that stops people, unfortunately, is this delayed onset. So it's it's often a two day event. If it's really significant, it can be a three day uh, event where you're you're feeling pretty tender and sore to move, and something that will, um, you know, ideally pass. You know, my wife's doing a great job getting back to exercise, but she's had some pretty sore days, and we've I've been trying to counsel her to like, hey, let's just get you doing some light biking now with your legs to to get kind of get some of the blood flow and start moving some of that stuff. Because our natural tendency is to just, I'm just not going to move, I'm going to rest. And again, rest is okay, but sometimes actually movement actually helps things. So I think there's a little bit of a lack of that. One other area I think that gets kind of hesitant, people hesitant to you know exercise or maybe stop the exercise is arthritis. We spoke, I think, to arthritis in some of our talks, but if can you 
discuss a little bit about kind of where movement fits in managing managing arthritic joints and how that can maybe overcome some of the barriers people have to starting exercise with arthritis? Yeah, by nature of uh, the name arthritis, uh, it means inflammation of the articular cartilage of a joint. And often we see this in the knee and the hip. So there are a lot of factors that we could really dive into as we did previously. But in terms of movement, if there's inflammation within the joint, we need to flush it out. And so movement is a prime example of the joint moves. It flushes fluid. It helps it get reabsorbed, as well as the muscles contracting around the joint help kind of flush in nutrients and, and pull out waste. And there's just sort of this effect of this consistency with movement and muscle activity that can help reduce some of this inflammation. Not only that, the repetitive movement within the arthritic joint uh, sensitizes that joint. You know, as you say, it can build that callus within the joint, meaning the brain gets used to that stimulus of movement. Um, and so it becomes less and less of a painful stimulus and more recognized as, uh, as, as more of a movement uh, stimulus. Um, it's not as easy as that. We've sort of dumbed it down here, but um, time and time again, movement with arthritis is the, is the conservative treatment. Um, guided movement through physical therapy certainly is where people get a lot of benefit from, but they're not with us forever. You know, they, they feel better. They feel X percent better. Our time with them has largely decreased a lot where they've learned the tools and the moves and the exercises. They just keep going with it and keep that that body responding well to movement. So exercise and arthritis is hand in hand. Uh, you cannot come across a research study on the benefits or the physical therapy and arthritis and not come across that it's movement and exercise. Which is tough. I think sometimes the struggle people have is finding the entry point to movement. And But you'll hear stories and a lot of people might have this experience like, you know, gosh, I get up in the morning or if I've been sitting for a while and it's pretty yes. stiff and the joints will be way bit sore, but the more I move, the better it feels, it works its way out. And that's usually a great sign um, that, hey, movement's probably gonna be a good thing for you. It's just, where are we starting with you, getting a baseline? And that's one of the things we try to find with patients as they're starting an exercise program of like, where are we starting? What are your goals? And start to build a, pro a process to build you up to the goals. Where I think some of the mistakes people make is they try to go too much too soon and either have that horrid soreness response or they do cause maybe a strain or a sprain to something that their body's not used to. And then they feel like they're right back at square one, not able to exercise, or they just they just make a decision that exercise just isn't for them. I think hopefully taking a more nuanced, smart, slow and steady approach can help you gain that success early on and be able to carry it over more long term. I, I will comment one last thing. We've talked generalized on pain and arthritis, but uh, there's also considerations. You know, if someone out there is listening has an underlying pathology, a specific one, let's say they have diabetes, you know, the blood sugar changes in our body when we exercise. So this is why consulting with your, your healthcare team when you embark on an exercise program can be helpful. Uh, someone who has a connective tissue disorder like Alo Stanler's disease, you know, they have hypermobility, you know. So what is this sort of global um, theme of their exercise routine relative to someone who doesn't have that hypermobility? That's going to change. And, and really physical therapists can really help develop that for someone. Um, I even came across something looking into this before we talked about migraines. It was just a quick study, but it, uh, it was in 2020. Um, and they found that the frequency of episodic migraines uh, would reduce uh, if you if someone uh, did moderate vigorous exercise three days a week. Now, the intensity of that headache, you know, the, the intensity of it didn't quite change, but the frequency may have. Um, that's just one study I came across. It's not, you know, fact, but I do think it is a trend in the right direction, even for something like headaches. So, but uh, the, the point I'm making is that if there is a specific underlying pathology uh, and exercise can influence that, uh, speak with your healthcare team to kind of find the right, right way for you. Yeah, couldn't echo that as much. And you kind of get into kind of like how much exercise um, as far as, um, you know, the guidelines, I think, give us a good kind of base to go off of. Now, guidelines are guidelines. I always say they're kind of like guardrails, you know, as far as like where to go. There's a lot of nuance and fitting it to unique people. Because, um, But can you speak to a little bit of the guidelines? You know, there's the American College of Sports Medicine. I just put the in the chat, in the comments, the World Health Organizations, and they're pretty similar. There might be some subtle differences in, in recommendations, but they're pretty similar as far as how much exercise ideally we're getting to maintain health. 
We do live in a society where movement isn't as much of our digitized society, where we may be sitting at desks and not moving as much. And we, yeah, as you see us here sitting at a desk, um, and that has negative health effects. If you're not supplementing your lack of movement at work with maybe a movement program away from work. So again, that's where we can come in and help you. But Tom, can you speak to some of the guidelines as far as where they're recommending exercise fit into somebody's life and how much and what that all means? Yeah, I think uh, no matter where you look, World Health Organization or American College of Sports Medicine, those are two common resources for this. They, they're they generally the same. Uh, the, the link you had on the World Health Organization uh, is nice because it kind of splits it into age groups. So it can be as what kind of physical activity are we is most beneficial for uh, a kiddo, uh, you know, a teenager, an adult. So I do like that split. But uh, in general, the American College of Sports Medicine is where I was pulling my data from. Um, and they recommend moderate intensity aerobic activity for 30 minutes, five times a week. OK. Or vigorous intense. I'll get to this in a second. Or vigorous intense exercise or aerobic, aerobic activity for 20 minutes, three times a week. Now, that seems like a lot of crazy math. But what it really means is that for about 20 to 30 minutes a day, you are doing moderate to very vigorous amount of aerobic activity. So getting that heart pumping, getting that heavier breathing. What does vigorous intensity mean? Well, usually if it's moderate, you can talk while you're doing it, but you wouldn't be able to really elevate your voice or sing. That's a common way to describe it for people. So if I'm working on a treadmill, I could potentially be able to have a few sentence conversation with someone, but I'm breathing heavy, but I couldn't sing to them. I know that seems odd, but it helps us understand uh, that, that degree. And then when we're talking about vigorous activity, you're not really able to talk. You're sort of out of breath and you're trying to kind of keep that those lungs pumping and maintaining that respiratory system. So um, the more intense we get, the maybe the less time we would need it within the week to get those health benefits. This is not set in stone. This is a guideline. So I think everyone tends to kind of require a bit different degrees or whatever your goals are um, require a little different. Not only that, this American College of Sports Medicine, they recommend resistance exercises as well, not just aerobic activity. So they stress the major muscle groups. I would call them the beach body muscle groups, you know, the, the impressive ones, uh, at least two times a week with resistance. Um, they don't really get into, at least in these recommendations, is it high resistance? Is it low resistance? And again, this all comes to something we'll talk about shortly here of uh, what are your goals, right? So if your goals are one thing, maybe you're using heavy weights, but low reps or the opposite if your goals change. Um, but I think that's a nice summary. And I encourage people to look at these two resources just to get an idea, especially if they are maybe on the edge of not sure how to exercise. They really haven't done it uh, um, consistently and they don't they're not sure on where to start. That's a good sort of guideline of how much activity we should be having per week. You know, I, we're going to get into what type of exercise because there's, again, I, we spoke a little bit about is this the gym exercise, is this whatever, and l look at Steve putting pickleball as his new exercise program for 2024, and that's a good example of something that, to me, I'm one that I'd rather do something I enjoy. I'm not good at standing on a treadmill, and I feel like I'm my, you know, my hyperactivity tends to get stirred up trying to sit still like that and run in one spot for a while. Uh, maybe it's walking outdoors. You know, in Phoenix, we're lucky, you know, right now, unless you're indoors in the Chicago area, pickleball isn't much of an option. Right now, it's like prime time to get out there in the pickleball courts. But that's a, a great option, especially for some of our folks. It's a little lower intensity, but allows you to have some, some good movement activities. So in the end, it's finding activities that you enjoy that you can stick with. Because again, if, if the gym is the worst place, like going to the dentist for you, then I, I don't think that might be the best choice of, you know, what we need to choose for exercise you and that's where we try to work with you if we're if you're in physical therapy and we're trying to help you transition to a exercise program um, or we're counseling some of our patients on that um, it's what do you like to do so that would be the number one thing for type of exercise now tom puts out some good information about you know we do ideally have some strength training involved especially um, as i mentioned with osteoporosis and different things some of the weight bearing and contractile exercise keeping strength um, man, it's just a buffer in life against falls, we already mentioned, and other things. So having some strength training, 
two times a week at least would be a helpful amount of strength training to engage in. And as Tom mentioned, the major muscle groups, and you can do that in the confines of your home with body weight. You don't need to have a gym. No, you can definitely do it at the gym as well with equipment and machines. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of programs out there um, that you can do that don't require you to go to a gym that still give you a very good vigorous workout in your muscles that will, will do the job. So yeah. Any other thoughts you have on types of exercise? There's a myriad of them out there, Tom. What's been your experience and how do you kind of go about that, working that with patients? Yeah, you're not going to find the holy grail of 10 exercises that, you know, work for every single person. But uh, I, I keep reflecting that it, it, it goes back to what is the, what is the individual's goal? Um, are they wanting to improve their cardiovascular endurance? Or they want to be less short of breath when they walk, you know, through the grocery store? Do they want to get a better uh, jump height? you know, for their intramural sport that they're in, you know, and so that really just requires a tailor of the exercises to them. But um, I really appreciate what you said that, you know, body weight and our home environment are frequently the only tools we have with our patients. And we can get pretty darn creative with getting them to move and exercise, whether it's resistance or even aerobic activity in the confines of their home. Um, you know, that you may have limits with certain of these exercises, and that's when you need to branch out and start discovering it. In addition to specific exercises, I think it's important to point out that there is a huge benefit from group exercise routines, you know, and, and there's all different styles of those. And there's a lot of benefits out there for whether it's, um, you know, Pilates, which I love uh, with some of my patients needing core work or glute work, uh, yoga for some of that flexibility or those static kind of um uh, muscle contractions and weight bearing positions and different postures. We have uh, Tai Chi, which has been researched to death in its ability to help with someone who's a fall risk or has decreased balance. So uh, group courses uh, that tailor to some of that stuff um, do really well. So um, there's a lot out there. And I think a physical therapist, I mean, that's, we do this all day is, is decide on which exercise is going to benefit someone based on their individualized, you know, framework. And um, if you have a good relationship with a physical therapist, it doesn't need to be 12 sessions of therapy. You know, you can be healthy and talk to a physical therapist. You don't have to be in pain to come talk to us. Uh, we're more than happy to spend an hour with you and say, hey, here's what I think would benefit you. Here's where you're weak. Here's where the deficits that we see. Try these things for now. Call me in a month and let me know how you're doing or if we need to progress it or change it. So uh, a little shameless plug there, Mark, but uh, I think that's a good start. <laughs> well, and I couldn't agree more. Obviously we're a biased audience here today, but it, you know, this upstream thought process, sometimes we wait for this till the wheels fall off. Like you encounter a physical therapist when things are going really bad and we're happy. Obviously that's our, uh, one of our strengths is to help people navigate out of those tough times when life and pain become maybe a large barrier or other issues occur. But it's, I think it's much more being practice from patients that to engage with a physical therapist more as a regular part like you don't like go away from your dentist and never see them again like you you engage and you maintain good tooth health um, and good dental health uh, for the long term and I think physical movement health is our MO to help you stay in that game as well um, so definitely find a physical therapist whether it's us at the Midwestern PT Institutes or somebody in your local area that can help you um, stay in the game but I agree I think a one-time visit to to engage and get, if you're not confident, or you're not sure, obviously, if you have the tools and you have the, you, you, we know health wise, you're safe to engage and you probably don't need physical therapists to, to guide you. But if you're having troubles or concerns, or you have health conditions that you want a professional's opinion on, that's obviously what we're here to do for you. So don't hesitate to reach out, um, give our clinics a call or again, your local physical therapist um, to help you in that pursuit. Um, consistency, Tom, one of the big challenges for people you know, the, this is the famous time of year where you go to the gym and it's hard to find any space because it's packed with people. There's everybody's got the New Year's resolution. And then we're probably in the next week or two, it starts tapering off as the consistency wanes. And we've all done this. I know I've done it as well with diets and exercise and things, um, trying to make massive changes that don't end up being sustainable. Can you speak to some of the abilities for folks to stay consistent? Because I think that's a huge challenge that a lot of people have with exercise. Yeah, I mean, that's that I always tell patients that it's really difficult to get into a consistent exercise routine. 
And I throw out this idea of four to six weeks. If you're consistent for four to six weeks, it becomes just a little bit easier to keep that ball rolling in your daily life. The problem with that is if you fall off that wagon for one week, it becomes another difficult several week process oftentimes to get back into that. So it's a challenge. I mean, and this is where um, I think a lot of uh, sources kind of try to give their ideas of what helps us stay consistent. I'm going to quickly list some uh, just because I don't want to go too long here. But um, I think some of the big ones are one that you mentioned. One of the top ones is finding stuff you like to do. Don't be torturing yourself with things you hate. If you hate riding a stationary bike, don't feel like you ha- that's the only thing that's going to help you. Uh, there's a variety of machines and exercises that we keep mentioning that may do it. And you may actually enjoy better than sitting. On- I hate riding a bike. It hurts my butt. Um, I can't do it for that long. So I choose other other things to get me a similar outcome. Um, the big one for me is setting goals. We set goals all the time with our patients. You know, if we have someone who uh, hurt their shoulder and they want to be able to reach into their upper cabinet, we create goals to help them reach that, whether it starts with a short term goal, but ultimately being able to lift, you know, five pounds or whatever out of their cabinet. Similar for you is your goal weight management. Okay, I want to see this short term change in a couple weeks or this long term change in a couple months and then track that progress. That's going to just be motivating. And when you do short term goals, when you can check off a short term goal, there is a psychological value to that in achieving something. And that is really propelling you forward. These goals, write them down. <clears throat> again, long and short term, make them achievable. Okay. So if you're, I want to lose hundred pounds in a month, come on, get out of here, make it reasonable uh, and measurable. So how, how do you know you actually met the goal? Oh, I can step on a scale or uh, now I can lift X amount of weight 10 times. Um, so I, I really am a fan of that. Tracking your progress is big. Get a, get a notebook, get an app. Technology is amazing now, whether it's managing your diet, or managing your exercise. Some can even tell us how many calories we're burning. Some of that stuff's amazing. Um, and managing your expectations. You know, you're gonna get sore. You're gonna maybe have a little twinge here or there and you gotta listen to your body. And does that mean you then contact your resource like a therapist? Or um, managing your expectations in terms of your goals. You know, you can't expect to be able to run 10 miles if you only started running two weeks ago. So I think that's a big one is we don't, we're not, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? It, it needs to take time with this. And the last thing is uh, to stay consistent, use your resources. Like I said, either technology, your physio or physical therapist, you know, we're great resources. Uh, personal trainers are fantastic. I mean, that's an obvious, right? You know, a lot of them are trained even more so than just understanding exercise, but maybe mechanics as well as strength and conditioning, endurance training. And I think they can be fantastic resources or even just the obvious of being able to guide you on a weekly basis into achieving the goals that you set. So I didn't want to not mention that because resources are everywhere, not just physical therapy, but but all over. Yeah, I would definitely echo the personal trainer thoughts. There are some great trainers out there that can kind of be with you, especially in the gym setting and help you kind of meet those goals and adapt to some of the challenges you might have with the equipment and things. And often, often some very knowledgeable people that can help keep you accountable. Sometimes it's helpful to have a physio or a personal trainer or somebody who's holding you to a schedule that's have some accountability. That's the other strength of group fitness that you can have a group of people who are keeping you accountable that kind of give you a little guff, maybe text you on your phone. Why weren't you in class today? Or where were you today? That's kind of what I do with my group fitness stuff that I do. Um, it's a great way to kind of stay on it. Um, one question Marion had as far as how often you recommend doing a check-in. So Tom, how often would you, if you're a physio working with a patient who's trying to engage in exercise, how often would you be having them check in? Um, you know, it, I, I usually make that decision based on what I've uh, determined on that specific patient. So if this is a, a new endeavor for them, they really have no exercise, they don't understand the, the, the likely response. And, you know, I can, and we start them with something smaller or, or a little more generalized. Maybe I follow up with them after a couple of weeks and say, okay, how's that been going? Have you had any pain? Do you feel like you're being challenged? Are you getting soreness? And then we can adjust from there. 
or if you have someone that's been an athlete for 15 years, they just recovered from an injury and they're like, okay, I got these exercises now. I want to, here's my goal for the long term. I may follow up with them in six weeks or longer, you know, work on this, strengthen these muscle groups, call me in six to 12 weeks just to make sure that you're headed in the right direction or if we need to modify anything. I don't know about you. Is that similar for you? Yeah, I think it's a case by case basis, like the newer, more unsure, or there's like, you know, a significant history of pain and things, maybe a little bit more frequent check ins early on. And then as we see things stable over time, we can start weaning or pushing that out more longer term. Sometimes we'll get people who come in the clinic um, for that in person, really good physical assessment, make sure there's nothing, uh, you know, that would preclude us from wanting to get you engaged in an exercise or maybe understand maybe some of the limitations we would need to kind of tailor exercise specifically for you. But then we've had patients who follow up via telehealth. Uh, we also have, um, are we're fortunate, we have a documentation system that once you're in our system, for us, and this usually occurs with most physical clinics now, um, you can message in and I can respond quickly. Like, hey, I'm sore doing X exercise. And um, if it's something I can respond quickly back to somebody, we do that. Otherwise, if it needs to be a formal like telehealth, you know, over the internet type appointment, we can do that as well. Um, but it's kind of the follow-ups definitely as long as people are staying stable, we start, like I said, weaning away and then eventually just checking in from time to time um, to, to make sure everything's going well. Sometimes people want to know, man, I feel like I've hit a plateau. I want to progress a little further. Well, we can definitely do that um, or give di people different avenues. They're looking at trying different modes of exercise and help counsel them on that as well. So, yeah, good question, Mary. Thanks for thanks for uh, sharing that. Well, uh, any uh, if there's any other questions, don't hesitate to drop them in the comments. Um, Tom, do you have anything else you would um, you have to as we wrap it up for today? No, I, I think the main points were were good. Uh, exercise good, sloth is bad, um, right? We want to move, and that helps so much. Uh, but we do recognize it's easier said than done. There's a lot of barriers, um, but thankfully, there's a lot of resources. Whether it's you know technology or family and friends or uh, your your healthcare team or personal training or group classes. Um, I also like dedicating yourself to to understanding what the exercise does to your body and and uh, what your response to that may or may not be. So um, I don't have anything additional to add. No, I would definitely say movement is life. You know, movement is what keeps us engaging in the world and the life that we want to live. So we're happy if we can help you engage in that. Hopefully, you got some value out of what we discussed today to keep your movement health as good as possible. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us via the social media channels that you're watching this on now um, or calling of our clinics. We're happy to have some discussions with you if you have some movement concerns in your world. So if you, you have an idea of another topic as well, leave a yes, comment. Yes, don't hesitate. Throw a comment <laughs> in the comments of any other topics that might be of interest to you with your uh, current movement struggles or physical therapy related topics. Um, and we're happy to talk about those next time. So. Again, thank you for your time this week. Really appreciate you spending some of your precious time watching our content uh, and hope to see you next stream next month. Thanks, Mark. See you.